Good morning. Good morning. I see people are coming in. Excited to welcome you back today. Just let her come in. Just want to make sure that that we are all here. This is a very important topic, one that that hits close to home, as you'll you'll see throughout the show today. So I want to get started. Thank you all and welcome to the Downtown Download. I am Shalonda Stokes, the president of Downtown Partnership and always excited to be with my partner, Councilman Eric Costello. Today we have some amazing um, guests for you today. If you've been following um, what's happening in the news, if you've been following what's happening in our hearts, um, we want to make sure that we bring you information, I know it's a, it, you're inundated with information, we want to make sure that we're bringing you stuff that you can act on, that you get information that's direct. And so we have Karina Mandel and Alex Chisnick today to, to help give you some, I'll give you their bios, their bios are amazing. Um, and so I'll give that to you a little bit later in the show, but just wanted you to know so that you stay tuned um, to, to hear them. Today, we want to talk about a couple of things before I shift, you know, our normal format, I'll talk a little bit about what's happening at Downtown Partnership. I'll pass it over to Councilman Costello to talk about what's happening in the city. Um, I'll come back and introduce our guest today, Councilman Costello. He, he'll hit them with the hard questions, no, not the hard questions, but the important questions. And then we wanna make sure we're getting questions from you. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. We'll make sure that we try to get to all of them throughout the show. So let me start a little bit with downtown partnership. I do have, and, and I may try to find Nicole throughout this process, a photo from this past Saturday's spring planting. When I tell you, I just wanna give a shout out to the Otterbound community. They came out this weekend, we did a planting. Thank you, Councilman Costello for joining us. I mean, we had some of our board members, Monica has taken over as our, chair of the Clean and Green Committee. And when I tell you she's kicking butt and taking names, she is. So I thank her. Um, board Chair Mark Wasserman came out. Um, and then Analea even brought some treats. So like our board is engaged, our team was engaged, the community, it felt really, really good. And, and it, you know, just, I think an entrance to what we're talking about today, it's about community coming together and doing what we can for each other. So this was this Saturday, it's not the last, um, I want to give Steve on our team a shout out. I think he did a phenomenal job. It's funny. I'm going to just tell a little side story. I'm planting. I've never planted like this before. And so one of the neighbors, Rosemary, is, is showing me how to plant. And, um, and, and she doesn't know that I'm the president of Downtown Partnership. So she starts to tell me about the team. And she's telling me about Steve. It was just an amazing experience. I didn't let her go too far. I was like, wait a minute, let me just tell you before you say anything bad. But it's just a shout out to, you know, what people do when people aren't looking. And so I'm just appreciative of our team for that. Hopefully, speaking of our team, you saw our new uniforms. Um, if you have not, I'll make sure that you see them go out. They are just as functional as they are beautiful, um, you know, designed so that there's no negative space. We're taking advantage of color. But the most important thing I think for our team is they are comfortable. Um, these, these are, it's funny, I did when I first started a tour with the team, like I was out cleaning. And as you're bending and doing certain things, you really wanna make sure that you have materials that stretch and are warm and do all of that. And so I'm just thankful to Nicole and Lauren and our team, uh, Benton. I can start to name a whole bunch of people in our team who work to get those uniforms done. But the beauty of them is they were picked by our ops teams, like they picked the color, they did something, so it was in, they were involved in all of that. And the last thing I want to highlight this, you know, this morning, is we have the state of downtown coming. We do this every year. It's a look back. This year, we're not only looking back, but we want to look forward, and we're bringing in some exciting panelists. So we have a slide that will highlight towards the end of the show, but that's May 9th. And so I just ask you to mark your calendars, May 9th for the state of downtown. So Councilman, you know, I could take all of this time. I'm up with my five minutes. I wanna transition it over to you to talk about what's happening in the city. Thanks, Shalonda. It's great to be back for another episode of uh, Downtown Download. Couple quick city updates. Uh, first, I, I believe as most of our viewers are aware, uh, the mask mandate has been lifted. Um, beginning on Monday, April 4th, city office buildings, including City Hall, uh, the Benton Building, which is 417 East Fayette Street. That's where you would get uh, things like your permits. Uh, the Woolman Building at 200 North Holiday Street. And that's a uh, building where you would go to pay taxes uh, as well as to pay your water bills. All those buildings are going to re reopen. 
Uh, so please stay tuned. That begins Monday, April 4th. Uh, recycling collection remains bi-weekly. Uh, as many of you are aware, we rolled out some pretty robust outdoor seating programs uh, two years ago. Those programs have been pretty successful. Shalanda and I have been working directly with the mayor's office uh, to get that reauthorized. So more information to come on that in the very near future. Uh, coming up in early June uh, will be 63 hours in one week of budget hearings in the city council. Uh, it is a very tantalizing time of year. I hope you will uh, join us. <laughs> You can also check my social media for uh, one or two bullet point uh, cliff notes summaries. Uh, and finally, we want to thank Mayor Scott. Uh, he recently announced uh, $4.9 million in ARPA funding for tenant build outs for Lexington Market project, right. which is incredibly important right. uh, to downtown, especially downtown's west side. So really excited about that project. I uh, just want to make sure we thank the mayor. Uh, back to you, Shalanda. Perfect. This is good. No, this is this is some exciting stuff that's coming out. So I know Mayor Scott and his administration is digging in deep. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about our guests. Now, I normally don't do full bios, but I thought it was appropriate today to do at least um, give context so that you know what, what you're hearing and who you're hearing from. So I'd like to start with you, Karina. Um, she was born in Nepro, Ukraine and immigrated to Baltimore when she was seven years old grew up in Stevenson and studied psychology, sociology and education at St. Mary's College in Maryland. After a few years um, employed in social services, she switched to entrepreneurship, you know, it's a part of our heart, working across the city on a range of projects from citywide hackathons to aquaponics to housing. Um, she's been focused on the intersection of social responsibility and the innovation economy, began working with the Baltimore Odessa Sister City Committee and continues to cultivate her engagements through the Jewish and Ukrainian community, as well as relationships with the international community, com community at large to fulfill her philosophy of living as a global citizen. Seven months ago, she met with Mayor Turkunov Tur Tur um, of Odessa, um, Ukraine, where they discussed a wide variety of topics for collaboration. This is what's important. I mean, you think about different things. This is music and the arts, thinking about like Peabody, the opera house, culture and exchange during festival and holidays, technology, talking about cybersecurity and economic development and collaboration between our ports. So all important things there. Alex, I'm gonna give you your bio as well. He was born and raised in Kiev, Ukraine. His family immigrated to the United States in 87 when Ukraine was still a part of the Soviet Union. And he graduated from UMBC and attended the University of Baltimore School of Law. After graduating from law school, he, commissioned, he was commissioned as a naval officer in the Navy's Judge Advocate General's Corp and spent six years on active duty as a military prosecutor and in-house counsel to multiple naval commands. After spending a year with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Eastern District of Virginia, he left the Navy as a lieutenant commander and joined Blades and Rosenfeld, the oldest law firm in the state of Maryland. Um, goes on to a little bit about where he became a partner um, in that. And so it's really great to see um, his growth after leaving the IT company in 2021. He founded his own company called Global Operations Group with a focus on helping Ukrainian businesses expand into the United States. So as of three weeks ago, and I say all of that, he shifted his business and personal efforts to helping Ukraine and its people survive the Russian attack. He founded Global Operations Group Ukraine A, Ukraine Aid, that's a nonprofit raising funds and collecting supplies and equipment so badly needed by the Ukrainians displaced in the country, as well as those defending their homeland against the Russian invasion. So I thought it was important to just give context. This isn't, you know, somebody who just said, hey, let me tell you, you all are a part of it, you're from there, you're giving back, and you've been invested in that work. And we just thank you for joining us today. Councilman, I know I'm gonna turn it over to you for the questions. Thanks, Shalanda, appreciate the uh, great introductions. Um, Karina, Alex, thank you so much for being here with us today, especially on short notice to cover really a timely topic. Um, before we really get into the questions, um, for those who may not be aware, could you guys provide a brief history of the tensions between Ukraine and Russia to kind of help clarify the context of the current conflict and war between the two countries. 
Sure. Um, uh, Eric, Shalanda, thank you very much for having us on the call and uh, uh, giving us an opportunity to speak about this important timely topic. Um, in, uh, in preparing for this call, and thank you for providing some of the questions, I guess, ahead of time, um, I, I refreshed myself on the history of Ukraine. So I'll just give a very brief background as to what gave rise to the current tensions. Uh, Ukraine has a long history, about 1,000 to 1,500 years, way before Russia was even on the map. Um, and uh, as many countries in Europe over the last 1,000 plus years, it became, uh, it was ruled, that area was ruled by different warlords and kings and queens from Russia and Ukraine and Poland and Lithuania and, and so on. Uh, but really the modern conflict uh, started to form in, in, in around 1917, 1920, when Russia uh, under King, uh, then the Russian King was ruling Ukraine as well as multiple areas around it. And Russia experienced a communist revolution in 1917. Ukraine tried to break away from Russia to become an independent state and uh, fought a three-year war. It lost uh, that war and became part of the Soviet Union for the following 80 years. Um, so in 1991, when the Soviet Union broke apart, uh, Ukraine finally gained its independence has been recognized by the international community, including Russia. Um, so for the last 30 years, Ukraine has been an independent sovereign country, just like all the countries that we're used to in this world. And um, uh, President Putin, uh, who is a product of the USSR as a former KGB officer in the USSR, it didn't, doesn't really sit well with him. It never sat well with him as he became president of Russia. So over the last 30 years, he and his government has tried to control the Ukrainian government through various political uh, moves. They uh, engaged in military actions on the east and the south in 2014. Uh, they annexed uh, Crimea, which is a big portion of Ukraine in the Black Sea. Um, and uh, the, really the military conflict between the countries has continued over the last eight years. Um, what has really pushed, um, or so the, the information goes, what really pushed them over the edge on, on February 24th, just about three and a half weeks ago, is that over the last 10 years, despite all the tensions, despite the conflicts with Russia, Ukraine has become really a powerful force in, uh, in, on the European continent. It became a European country more so than, uh, than an Asian, a Eurasian country. Uh, it formed closer ties with the United States and other Western countries in Europe. Uh, it had the fastest growing IT sector. Um, its agriculture um, exports uh, are you know, top five, top 10 countries in the world in terms of agriculture export, uh, exports, uh, minerals. Um, it, it's really just a very rich country in terms of the natural resources and obviously the people. So uh, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it was just for the sole purpose of controlling it taking advantage of, of the country, taking advantage of its people, taking advantage of its resources, and, uh, and just really a political move to expand the Russian influence and the Russian empire. There's no other reason for it, despite what you're hearing or may have heard on TV coming from the Russian media. Um, and um, uh, it's, it really has just uh, you know, started as a two-day, three-day campaign by Russia to, uh, in, in hopes of overtaking the Ukrainian government and controlling it. Well, they failed. The Ukrainian people have nothing to do um, or, or doesn't want to have anything to do with Russia or its control of its country. So uh, the Ukrainians have fought back and they've been fighting back for the last three and a half weeks um, as a much smaller uh, country in terms of even, you know, just to give you some military numbers, um, Russia outnumbers Ukrainian forces about five to one. Uh, both in human power, in planes and ships and tanks and everything else that goes along with it. And uh, the Ukrainian people have been holding back uh, this force for the last uh, three and a half weeks, which unfortunately has resulted in Putin and his uh, government really taking a kind of scorched earth approach to the country. He can't win it militarily. We're just going to destroy it and kill as many people as we can. So that's the situation where uh, we're in now, and um, uh, three and a half, three and a half million Ukrainians have been displaced from the country to uh, other countries in Europe. Uh, about two to three million uh, have been displaced in country, and it's just going to continue until Russia, uh, Russia stops. So, um, how this ends at this point, no one knows. Thank you. That's that's a uh, that's a lot. Um, to, to say the very least, um, especially to hear about 
you know, the numbers of, of refugees, both outside of the country, as well as those of that, that have been um, displaced in the country, but very helpful context and why this is, you know, very relevant to what's going on right now. Um, Karina, as, as Shalanda mentioned, you are the chair of the Baltimore Odessa Sister City Committee. Um, could you talk a little bit about what a sister city is? What's the mission of, of the Baltimore Sister City organization? What is the significance of that relationship uh, between Odessa and Ukraine uh, and Baltimore, Maryland specifically? Absolutely, happy to do that. Uh, thank you for having me on. Alex, for your comments and bringing everybody up to speed. Really grateful to be here. And uh, of course, happy to represent both Ukraine as my home country of birth and Baltimore as the city where I grew up in. Uh, as With that little introduction, I wanna also make a disclaimer that in this capacity, the hat that I wear today is to represent uh, the Baltimore Odessa Sister City Committee, which uh, is closely tied to the mayor's office and receives funding from them every year. And uh, as a personal stance and as a ch uh, the chairwoman for the Baltimore Odessa Sister City Committee, I wanna say that as we take the moral high ground here in these atrocities, we, we must self-reflect on how we ourselves could have done better. The fact that we sit on the hallowed ground of Native American people that used to live in Baltimore, specifically the Susquehanna River, uh, which we, we all know, by name uh, was personally for the Susquehanna people that used to live here and uh, standing against racial profiling and, and invasion of sovereign countries wasn't okay back then as much as it is not okay today. Uh, and certainly anyone who is not being given aid because they don't look or sound like whatever the typical Ukrainian might be uh, is something that I've personally denounced and requested from the mayor's team in Odessa uh, be not a part of the, uh, the behaviors that are happening. Uh, as we give aid, as we reach into our pockets, we all wanna make sure that that's going to each and every single uh, person that lives, works, visits, or stays in Ukraine, and that they have equal uh, right and access to, to safety and to humanitarian aid. All of that aside, uh, Baltimore and Odessa have been sister cities from 1974 when uh, President Eisenhower first created Sister Cities and then Governor Schaefer created this relationship with Odessa, which uh, at the time was a critical relationship and, and still continues to be in terms of having uh, a partner across an ocean uh, that's also a port city. And Odessa has about a million residents who, who live there, of course, before so many have led because, fled because of this war. And it's so critical in sharing that diplomacy and sharing culture and sharing the growth of technology and uh, all the expanses that, that we seek to have the, the, uh, in Baltimore, that those are similar for Odessa um, and that we learn from each other from, from whether our sister cities are also Rotterdam or uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and from the eight others uh, alongside myself, uh, the other sister cities that we seek to be global citizens and a global representation for partnership, which couldn't be more important at this critical time. To, um, to add on to what, to what Alex has been saying, it's definitely a David and Goliath situation. We're talking about the budget of New York uh, Police Department is larger than the budget of the Ukraine entire military force. Even police departments from the US have been donating gear to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, so the, the military budget was 6 billion in 2020 and the New York Police Department budget was 11 billion. That's sort of what we're talking about. To make it a little bit more personal, uh, 10 million people have been displaced. As, as Alex said, 3.5 million have fled Ukraine. And we're looking at that's 23% of the population, almost a quarter. We're talking about five times the population of Baltimore. So five entire Baltimore, Baltimore cities just up and left, up and vanished overnight. Uh, 17 times as many people, the population of Baltimore did not sleep in their own bed last night. Uh, and approximately 1.5 million children have fled Ukraine, according to UNICEF, uh, which is more than the entire population of all of the, even including adults of Odessa. This is really uh, just an absolute humanitarian crisis. And from everyone that I've spoken with, there's, uh, there's, 
not animosity toward the Russian heritage that we have. Uh, you will see here, I have the Russian nesting doll earrings on, I have Odessa in our background on my, on my Zoom background that looks very much like the port city of Baltimore. And that, that long time heritage that's been over thousands of years in Russia is not a reflection on the political activities of one leader that are, that are happening. And we seek solidarity with, with Ukraine and also for, for those that have family right across the border uh, in this conflict is a very difficult position to be in. Thanks, Karina. And it doesn't seem to be any surprise of, of the connection between Odessa and Baltimore with the port and, and the maritime community and how important that is to, to both cities. Alex, I want to hop over to you as, as a Ukrainian immigrant who started his own company in the United States focused on helping Ukrainian businesses expand right here in the U.S. Um, your work has often been focused on bridging gaps between communities. Um, however, in response to the recent war in Ukraine, uh, you recently took this step uh, a step further by starting your own nonprofit. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and the other work that you've been doing since its inception and how people can support these efforts? Absolutely. So, um, uh, my um, as Shalanda introduced me and thank you for the for the introduction earlier on. Uh, I was born and raised in Kiev, so obviously I have personal. Uh, and our professional ties to Ukraine. But I also grew up here in the Baltimore area. Uh, and there's a very large Ukrainian community that's been here for hundreds of years uh, in the Baltimore area. Uh, and um, uh, kind of, you know, kind of, I guess, goes up and down over the years as people come in. And a lot of them were from the uh, former Soviet Union, came in in the, in the 40s, the 80s, and the 90s. And my family was one of those. Um, so as I have uh, went through my professional career here in the United States and, um, uh, uh, and, and gotten to know people, make contacts and build a network, I realized that, uh, that the Ukrainian folks don't necessarily have the support um, uh, of organizational support to come and enter the US market. Over the, last, um, uh, over the last really close to 30 years since Ukraine gained its independence, it's been on an upward trajectory in educating its people and in, in growing the IT sector that was one of the main sectors, kind of professional sectors in Ukraine. And they've been really, really successful. They have really jumped on the world stage over the last 10 years or so and been recognized as one of the top professional destinations for, uh, for, for IT programmers, developers, and so on. So when I started my company about a year ago, obviously before any of the current conflict with Russia, um, I started a company to help Ukrainian companies enter the U.S. market, providing them not just the, uh, the legal support and the business executive support, but also cultural support and try to understand what it's like to operate in the United States, what it's like to operate in, in different states of the United States, and um, uh, specifically to Maryland. Um, obviously, I'm here. I live here. I grew up here. And so I have uh, a vested interest in the state and its success. And um, uh, the companies that I was working with, um, I've tried to forge their relationship with like the Howard County uh, business uh, uh, districts and um, uh, Baltimore City business districts. So they come here and they have a soft landing, they have some support and things like that. So over the last year, as I've started working with the Ukrainian companies, I've gotten to know a lot of people in Ukraine, in, in the commercial sector, in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the government and, and personally as well. And I was working with all of those people very closely over the last year, trying to bring their businesses here to the United States so they can benefit the United States economy as well when this war started on February 24th. So literally overnight, uh, the same people that I was speaking with on Wednesday, uh, February 23rd, to open, a, to incorporate in Maryland and to file paperwork in the state, to open their offices and start hiring folks in the state. On the next day on Thursday, they put on a uniform and went to defend our country. So it was a very abrupt shift for them. And it was a very abrupt shift for me uh, because like many here in, in the Baltimore area, Karina, uh, and other friends of ours, uh, professionals and personal, um, have we we kind of uh, were at a loss initially uh, because this was such a sudden and very aggressive military attack that I think the world was shocked. And if you've been watching the news over the last three weeks, it, I mean, it, it's been everywhere. It's just the first time in close to what 80, 80 years that um, uh, that another country just just attacked another country or neighboring country just for the sole act of aggression. 
um, there was there's no other reason for it. So um, uh, as I've gotten to know a lot of Ukrainian people uh, that I was working with over the last year, and then realized that they are putting on a uniform and going to the front lines to defend their country, um, I started asking questions, how can I help? And that's what most of the folks who have reached out to me and spoken to me over the last three weeks asked the same question, what's going on and how can I help? Um, so uh, I, 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 I received a lot of requests from individuals, from groups, from companies, from government offices in Ukraine in terms of things that they needed at the start of the war. Um, a lot of it obviously couldn't provide, but the humanitarian medical aid, things like that, that I could help with, uh, even clothing uh, for folks who started fleeing the country became a very important topic of conversation and action here locally. Um, so I know one of your uh, constituents in Baltimore City, Click Solutions, was one of the first companies out of the gate to start a clothing drive for displaced refugees who ended up in Poland, or, or millions of them ended up in Poland. So that was a tremendous clothing drive. And, and inst- what ended up as one container, we're looking for a little one truck or one container of clothing and supplies and medical supplies ended up being three, um, all of which have been sent to Ukraine um, and have been distributed to people in Poland and Western Ukraine to help those have been displaced. Um, but the same questions that I was receiving is I was trying to answer the questions as to how can we help and how can we get help where it's needed most. So my focus really became on um, trying to identify uh, funding and supplies and send it to inside of Ukraine. There's a lot of organizations in this world um, that support refugees, that support um, education and, and, and healthcare and uh, you know children. I mean, there's just a lot of uh, well-intended individuals and organizations that work globally. And they have provided a tremendous amount of help and support for the Ukrainian refugees in Eastern Europe, but it's hard for them to get this stuff into Ukraine itself. And that's when I started to have more close conversations with the Ukrainian government officials, as well as some of the commercial entities and individuals that are on the ground who are now just volunteering because that's all they can do. They're not working anymore. Um, They are defending their, their homeland. So Um, As I started those conversations, I started to run into some roadblocks as to what is it that's needed specifically, how do I get it here, how do I pay for it, and more importantly, how do I logistically get it over to Ukraine. So um, uh, I started a a small fund drive, raised about $6,000, sent it to a nonprofit in Germany that was set up by the Ukrainian refugees who left Ukraine uh, just a few days after the conflict started. Uh, They were able to buy supplies and get it into Ukraine very quickly. So I started working with organizations like that and try to establish a logistical uh, pathway in. I then received a request from the Ukr Posta, which is the National Post Office of Ukraine, to help them as they learn about what I do and trying to set up. Uh, and people here in, in the Baltimore community have been so, so helpful and so open in reaching out and saying, well, how can we help? So I didn't have a lot of answers as to where they can forward and, and their attention and, and funding. So I, had, I created my own nonprofit. It was really honestly the last thing that I wanted to do uh, in terms of the amount of work that it has taken and uh, the amount of work that it's going to take. But it, it's been tremendous. Um, over the last week with the support of uh, Wife for Taylor, uh, Preston, a local law firm in Baltimore, uh, Gorfine Schiller and Garden and Accounting Firm in Owens Mills, uh, and all the people, including the folks on this, on this call, all of you, um, I formed this, this nonprofit called Global Operations Group Ukraine Aid. Uh, this nonprofit is just undergoing filing with the IRS for the nonprofit uh, organizational approval, uh, but we are already active. To date, just in the last week, we have over $40,000 that's going, uh, that was raised, and that's going to buy medical supplies uh, that's going to go into Ukraine and into the cities that are really on the front lines to help those civilians that can't necessarily get the assistance that the large organizations like the Red Cross or UNICEF, sometimes they can't get those things to the front lines. And that's understandable. I mean, the country's in the middle of a war, so they can't just truck things in or fly things in sometimes. So they end up setting up kind of on the periphery and helping as much as they can. I want to try to get these things really to the people who need it the most. Um, so uh, that's, that's in short the organization. We have set up logistical relationship with uh, the National Post of Ukraine, the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Ukraine, uh, multiple nonprofits operating in Germany, Poland, uh, Lithuania, some other countries that are border, that border on Ukraine uh, for, them to, for them to help receive those items either in Ukraine itself or outside of Ukraine uh, close to the border and then truck those things in. 
Um, and uh, so that's that's a nonprofit. But I really also uh, wanted to kind of shift a little bit uh, and tell you just a couple of personal stories of the individuals that I have become friends with that started as clients a year ago, but now have become friends um, over the last year that I've been working with them and really very close friends over the last three weeks as I'm in touch with them on a daily basis, uh, trying to figure out, are they okay? Are they, how are their families? And um, I'll just say that whatever we see on the TV here, uh, on the news, all the photographs, all the, all the pictures and videos from there, it's absolutely true and it's absolutely worse on the ground because what we see is a photograph of one building that's been hit by a missile. What we see in real life is that there are five or six buildings around that have been absolutely demolished. So um, all of these people who have three weeks ago uh, went to work, put on a suit, put on their shirt, you know, put on their pants and shirts just like everybody else. Their kids played video games um, at home and, um, and their life was just completely turned upside down. Um, there's, there's one, I'll just mention one um, uh, story of one uh, person who I've gotten to know over the last year. He works for, for a small furniture company in Ukraine, and they were coming to the United States to build furniture for uh, hotels and cafes and restaurants. They've already gotten a couple of contracts. They've been very successful here over the last uh, six, seven months with a couple of smaller projects. And then this happened. So when this happened, the, the, the general thought process in Ukraine was that Putin was just going to attack large cities. So a lot of individuals moved their families to the outskirts to try to save them or protect them from all the bombings and the missiles that were landing in the middle of the cities and residential areas. Well, over a course of three or four days, um, the Russian military has really advanced to the outskirts of those cities and the same families that were just evacuated from Kiev or, or, or Kherson or Odessa or some other cities ended up behind the front lines. So now they're behind the front lines. The Russian soldiers are uh, preventing them from entering back into Ukraine. Uh, and, and their world is turned completely upside down. No electricity, no heat, no communication, no food. And they've been there for about 10 days until finally they were able to sneak back into the capital to re reunite with their uh, with their father and their husband who stayed in Kiev to support the territorial forces. So <clears throat> um, it's um, it, the, the entire country is at war. And uh, the, the goal was really to help people like him, families like him to get the stuff inside the country so it can be distributed to people who need it most. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> um, I, I want to shift over to um... You, you both have mentioned um, some of the things that are happening locally. Um, first, I want to take a, a moment to acknowledge my friends Arthur um, Olshansky and Neil Constantoulis from Click Solutions. Um, you know, Shalanda, we've heard this story a, a million times. It may not have been about Ukraine, but just about the generosity of Baltimoreans uh, and um, the, the willingness to really um, a, a, of the folks that live in Baltimore to take the shirt off their back to help people. Um, what started as a, a really a small little drive uh, at an IT office in, in Locust Point where, where Click Solutions is headquartered uh, turned into about 900 residents uh, stopping by throughout the day to drop off clothes, medical supplies, uh, non-perishable food items. Um, so it's really incredible to see, but again, for those of us who are familiar with the generosity of Baltimore, um, not surprising to say the least. Um, I think a lot of the folks on our audience today are, are joining us because they're also looking for the best ways uh, to help those that have been affected by the war in Ukraine. Uh, Karina, I know that you've put together a very handy document, which uh, I believe the Downtown Partnership staff are going to post online shortly after our webinar. Um, but let's dive into that a little bit. Um, and Karina, I want to start with you. Can you talk a little bit about how members of the Baltimore community can best help those in need uh, right now and, and kind of break down how aid can happen at different levels, such mm -hmm. as you know, individual support versus uh, business organizations, nonprofits, government, et cetera. Absolutely happy to. And if the, <laughs> the staff said downtown partnership with Baltimore, it would be so kind to uh, play the video that I wanted to share, which reinforces Alex's comments. There are logistical challenges to getting into Ukraine. And one of our partners uh, has been the World 
uh, Central Kitchen with Jose Andres, which fed Baltimore during the global COVID pandemic and was able to reach uh, the contacts that we have in Odessa. And uh, love to just uh, share this video and then happy to answer, answer the question. Um, go ahead and let's click play. Today we prepare our city for possibility of invade. When the war starts, I see that uh, all Ukrainians is like one big family because uh, everybody support and do everything what they can uh, for our country and for our people. This is a big respect and I really love Ukraine and Ukrainian people for this. Already come with a rocket attack, with bombing, but we're ready to meet our enemies. This brave part. We normal people, we want to live in developed world. We want thinking about to travel to Mars. We don't want building new border between the countries. We don't understand how in contemporary world some country can invade to other country with military uh, instruments. We want to uh, live in peace. We don't want to uh, fight with any of our neighbors. We have a baby with my wife, his name is Naum. He's uh, three months old, yeah, so he's a big guy. That's why we are doing now everything for our children. Slava Ukraini! It's critically important for World Central Kitchen to be in Odessa right now because it's the third largest city in Ukraine after Kiev and Kharkiv, both of which are under active bombardment. Odessa could be next. The city is preparing for this. So we're helping the chefs and the cooks of the city, the restaurants that are preparing food. We're also helping stockpile food to be ready. The city has set up a warehouse. We're working with the mayor's office. We're bringing trucks in. We're trying to give them everything that they need to hopefully get through this really, really difficult time. And this is what World Center Kitchen is all about. Boots on the ground. We're there standing side by side with our partners doing everything that we can. This is what we are living for. And I want uh, no one to live in a great Ukrainian country. Thank you so much for sharing that video. It certainly resonated with me as I hope it did with you. Only uh, just yesterday is the most recent update from the mayor of Odessa and his team. A military rocket from the Black Sea on a, on a Russian uh, naval ship for the first time hit a residential neighborhood. And in fact, one of the city employees was injured in, in that bombing. And uh, I have uh, the link to the photos and videos and media that I've shared uh, has some of those devastating photos. And uh, so the mayor of Odessa and his team are desperately worried about, about their citizens and this conversation couldn't come at a more critical time. Uh, certainly World Central Kitchen is one of the places where you can donate as an individual. We have a strong partnership with them and we know that every five to $10 that we give them goes to feeding people directly, not only in Odessa, but all over Ukraine, all over Poland as refugees flee. And uh, not only that, but they also pay the chefs in the restaurants and keep uh, that helps keep them afloat as, as they're doing the work of humanitarian aid to, to feed millions. Uh, so certainly and uh, World Central Kitchen, the work that Alex and his team have been doing and Click Solutions and their nonprofit work, uh, you can donate to Baltimore, Odessa, Sister City, and 100% of our proceeds are going directly to the city of Odessa. Uh, they uh, either through the Red Cross can donate to humanitarian aid or as well through their direct account. Um, they're able to choose whether they need tactical gear for military support or, uh, or whatever they might best need it for. Happy to have you volunteer your time. We're looking to continue to do our outreach, continue to do events, to make partnerships and build coalitions uh, at the city, state, local level, uh, as well with, as, as with other cities. In fact, there are 10 cities in America that are named Odessa. And I'd love to partner with them and show uh, solidarity with Ukraine and say not, not only are we a sister city by name, but there's other, other sister cities uh, across the US that, that are on board and stand behind you. Uh, 
I've also, so in this document, I mentioned that you can think about what your business or your employer, maybe where you work, you can ask them how they can best help Ukraine by sector, whether that's businesses sponsoring an upcoming event, whether that's in the healthcare sector, counseling uh, for trauma response to these mass casualty events. In the legal field, how can you, from the firm that you work at, how can you volunteer with the local uh, associations and nonprofits and to be a to be a, a resource that's critically needed in a time where immigration lawyers are so expensive and people in desperate need may often be scammed, not realizing that uh, if they don't go through some of the vetted channels, they uh, people are out there looking to, uh, to benefit from this disaster. Uh, in the IT field, lending any support that you can there. We've seen even the fashion community uh, stand up and support and change from ma manufacturing wedding gowns to making uh, tactical gear for soldiers there. Much in the way that we did uh, with Sagamore Rye producing hand sanitizer instead of rye uh, and having the support of the Baltimore community in a pandemic and get thinking of creative ways that, that, we, can, that we can help. Uh, one amazing story that I love is in manufacturing, there is a gentleman who started um, creating man, uh, Lego figurines of President Zelensky and they've raised over $160,000. So by that, I, there's creative ways individually that you can do things as uh, your business as well. There's innumerable amount of ways to be engaged and if commit to one, commit personally, commit, uh, discuss with your family how you'd like to be engaged and then as well, uh, who you'd like to help. So is that citizens that are still in Ukraine? Is that refugees that have fled and are in Poland? Would you like to uh, offer aid when refugees come and land in Baltimore? Uh, if that's to happen, what are the avenues for Ukrainian Americans and our neighbors and friends who are already here? And how can we make sure that there's a soft landing for, for, for them? And certainly connecting uh, on legislative ma matters and connecting there with your local city council person, with your local senator, with your U.S. senator and representatives as well, uh, and making sure that there's legislation that's passed, which does not currently exist, to make sure that uh, uh, families can be reunited, that there's funding uh, already laid out in this legislative year for the what will be the oncoming of certainly many people applying for refugee status or asylum. And those are several of the ways that you can individually support as well as uh, connect with the business community. We would love to have all of your support and certainly I'm looking for volunteers to, to help us and happy to have you email me afterward. I'm sure as Alex as well, we can, we'll take any help that we can get. This is, this is gonna be a marathon for sure. That's great. And I'm going to jump over to Shalanda in a second, because I know we've got a number of questions that came in uh, before the webinar. Um, one of the things that I think we were hoping to accomplish today um, when Shalanda and I were, were talking about the importance of this episode is really trying to identify meaningful ways um, for our audience and, and for the downtown community um, to help contribute and, and help out the Ukrainian people. So um, by having you two who are, who are so well connected um, on the ground in Ukraine and have these relationships, relationships, pardon me, um, identify, um, you, you know, uh, vetted organizations that, that our folks can go through, I think is, is incredibly helpful. Um, Alex, um, I'm going to jump to Shalon in one second. I don't know if you had anything to add um, in terms of that question, um, just with respect to um, different organizations and how members of, of, of the Baltimore downtown community and the business community can assist in these efforts. Yeah, uh, I assume you saw my raised hand uh, for a second. That was actually an accident. I clicked on it, uh, but I am uh, uh, happy to add just a couple of things that um, uh, that, that, were, that was learned uh, in, in the last multiple weeks as I've set up my organization to make contacts with others uh, who are trying to help Ukraine. Uh, there's, there's really, uh, from, from my perspective and, and, and my purpose in terms of the, the Global Operations Group, Ukraine aid support, it, there's two ways, right? There's, there's funding for purchase of supplies and equipment, humanitarian aid, rescue, life-saving equipment, things like that. Uh, and then there's the in-kind donations from either individuals or corporations who have things that are needed on the ground. Um, over the last several weeks, those needs have changed and evolved. 
um, in Ukraine, especially within Ukraine. Uh, medical help is really, and medical su supplies are really the number one item that, are, that have been asked for over the last week by both government organizations as well as individuals who are fighting either in the military units, volunteer units, territorial defenses. I mean, everyone's involved in this fight uh, against the Russian army. So um, the uh, for, for my organization, again, the organization name is Global Operations Group Ukraine Aid. Uh, Inc. The website is uh, uh, GOG for Global Operations Group. So GOG Ukraine Aid.org. Um, everything that's donated, anything from $5 to $5,000, 100% of it will be used to buy supplies and equipment needed on the ground and transported on the ground. There's no overhead, there's no salaries, there's no compensa compensation. This is uh, what we do. Uh, and, and as Karina said, this is going to be a marathon. This is going to be um, a while until this is this conflict is over. And it's certainly going to be a long time as the country is rebuilt, as the people begin to come back, um, as, uh, as the buildings begin to be rebuilt, the economy begins to be rebuilt. Uh, the need is only going to grow and grow and grow. So every little bit helps, whether you can volunteer or help with local events. And I'm sure Karina is going to talk about some of the local events that are going to be happening in Baltimore. Um, uh, or, or you donate your time to an organization like ours or someone, some other organization, uh, or a monetary contribution, which is, again, 100% will be used to buy the needed supplies and get them on, on the ground there. Uh, get in touch with us and ask the question, right? There's not enough time on this call to uh, go over the list of medical supplies that are needed. It's, it's three pages long, uh, rescue equipment that's needed and, and things like that. It's just, it's, it's, it's too much to have a conversation with the show on the screen, but I'm certainly happy if anyone's listening from uh, companies, organizations that, it, that, that, that's willing to help. Uh, maybe you've done so already, but maybe you're willing to do a little more. Please get in touch with us. Let us know what you can do. We will let you know what's needed specifically, and we'll figure out how to get it there into the people's hands. Um, that's that's all I wanted to say about that. And on the note of happy hour, um, a constituent <laughs> of mine, Katia in uh, Bolton Hill, uh, is hosting a Support Ukraine uh, fundraiser actually this Friday from 5 to 8 p.m. Um, at the Guilford Hall Brewery. If you haven't been on the 1600 block of Guilford Avenue, uh, it's right outside of Outtown. Great venue. Um, go by, uh, you know, meet some folks, help support a great cause. Uh, I'll put that information in the chat. And with that, Shalanda, turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm actually going to stay in that same vein um, and apologize. If I go out, Councilman Costello will pick up because I'm freezing a little bit here. Um, but, but I'd like to stay in the area of, um, especially Alex, since you sort of tossed it to Karina, around people are asking about group group activities, different things that they where they can engage. So I know you mentioned there may be some festivals or other things that we can connect with. Absolutely, thank you so much. And I think why, uh, if I can now reiterate even more uh, what Alex was saying, if we're taking a look to really, again, make this personal to Baltimore, uh, Mikhail Lviv is a two hour drive from Odessa. So we're talking about the, you know, the distance from here to Philly. Uh, people go to Odessa beaches in the Black Sea the same way that we go to Ocean City and enjoy uh, spending time with our families and walking on the boardwalk. Ordinary Ukrainians are training to become battlefield medics and there couldn't be a more dire situation, uh, certainly. So uh, all of these events, all of the funds to go toward helping our community there. And uh, of course, uh, Councilman Costello has been kind enough to say that uh, we, um, or as Baltimore, have been built on uh, immigrants coming here and making uh, Baltimore their home. And Baltimore is the emptiest that it's been since 1910. And uh, with making homes and, and other opportunities here that we have to make Baltimore a thriving community and I'm eager to, to welcome any of those uh, immigrants in, that may land here. And then in the meantime, we have Events certainly, we're looking at uh, having an event in May, in mid May, in Patterson Park. Uh, if you're if you're interested in helping at the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, they'll be I'm sure celebrating Easter in the upcoming uh, in April. We'll be having an event in May. The Creative Alliance is holding a benefit concert uh, Saturday, 26, and this is all in uh, in the link that I had sent and sort of the the background of Baltimore's sister cities and. 
Uh, there's a world art experience. There's uh, concerts, U.S. premieres in the in music, entertainment. We're doing a project with Enoch Pratt for preschoolers. If you have a child uh, you need to decompress a little bit and help them work through this, we're doing an event April 9th uh, for Pisansky uh, egg decorating. So as you look to celebrate Easter, there's a rich heritage of uh, Pisansky egg decorating and Fabergé eggs that come from, from Europe. That's a great connection here. Uh, Wednesday, March 28th, the United for Ukraine fundraiser, of course, at Bar Cucina. Uh, Friday, March 25th, the Support Ukraine uh, fundraiser at Guilford Hall that was mentioned. And Saturday, the 26th, there's a Feed the Homeless Community Initiative at Patterson Park Coffee Shop. There's uh, lots of events coming up, but certainly, and lots of opportunities to to contribute, and even if that's something like uh, checking in on on your friends who live in Ukraine or checking in on your colleagues who live in Russia as well. Uh, certainly, in uh, others have, have said that this is not just a, a battlefield uh, with with guns, but also in the battlefield of of the media and the conversation that's happening. And if other people on the other side are willing to listen to each other, are you can can you have a Russian family over for dinner? And have a dialogue about what's happening uh, and have that reciprocity and, and connection during these difficult times to understand the politics, but also the human, the human side of, of the neighbors and, and uh, what they might be hearing in the media compared to what's happening on the ground, certainly. So there's a way to engage individually and with local organization and events that are happening all over town. Perfect. Thank you. And we will be sure to, to summarize and send these out because people are asking. Um, this next question, actually, we got it in the Q&A and we also had it submitted as a pre-question because um, we know that that Ukrainians may be coming to the U.S., coming to Baltimore. Um, do you know if, if people are coming and how this community can engage in hosting or housing them if needed? Fantastic question. Uh, so I recently spoke with Catalina, who's with the immigration office at uh, the mayor's office. And there's effectively three ways that they can come here. There's uh, not yet been a, a designation by the UN for, for asylum and refugees to, uh, to, to come here, or rather refugees. Asylum is for people who may already be here uh, and refugees is for people that are coming from out of the country for that, for that designation. Uh, specifically, if you know someone that has a tourist visa, they can get here, land in, in the country and then ask for an adjustment of status for, to the asylum status, which unfortunately can take up to six years. And with the previous administration cutting funding to uh, immigration services at the federal level, uh, they've really been quite overwhelmed uh, and, and understaffed, uh, especially as they help the Afghan refugees that are desperately seeking adjustment of status or housing as well. Uh, what's been uh, uh, what's been started for people, uh, what's been activated for people that are already here is temporary protective status. So looking at anybody that was here short time for work, maybe a study abroad student that you know, uh, and that is for every 18 months and typically renews. And it's a temporary protective status because you're not able to go back home, uh, especially given so in this situation uh, with Ukraine and being in the middle of a war, as well as several other countries that are uh, experiencing conflict right now. And those people are unfortunately all over the world not able to go, to go back. Uh, the third caveat is something called a humanitarian parole, which is something that was created specific uh, for individuals in Cuba way back when, but then most recently again for, for Afghan refugees. And it's only good for, for one year and then they have to apply for asylum. And advocacy groups right now are diligently working uh, for the, the humanitarian parole to be an expedited uh, path to, to legislation, to path to citizenship uh, that doesn't have the long wait times of, of sort of, not to say that they can jump the line, but for um, for not to have them in this waiting holding period, mm -hmm. uh, that, that there's a direct, direct relationship to them being here. And then of course there are two, uh, two centers here in Maryland that work with resettling refugees, but then Lutheran services as well, the International Red Rescue Committee, which maybe many, many of you have donated to, their headquarters are in Baltimore, so engaging uh, with, with those on the, on the long-term marathon view of, of helping this community if and when they land in Baltimore. It's definitely the, the long-term play here. Got it. So better to go through those organizations to kind of help with housing that way so it stays 
sort of streamlined. I got that. So Absolutely. we'll make sure we include yeah. that information. And if anybody speaks Ukrainian, uh, the, the mayor's office is, welcomes anybody who would like to translate or who would like to be part of this dialogue to make sure that we're, we're uh, reaching the community most effectively. Happy to, to, to connect with any of those individuals who might want to help. Thank you. That was actually one of the upcoming questions. So you, you answered it already. Alex, I'm going to shift to you just for a minute talking about the banks. We have a question um, asking if the banks are operating in Ukraine. Yes, yes. The financial system is still operating. It, uh, it depends more on the geographical location, where it's in the country. If it's parts of the country where the Russian forces have control, then uh, uh, a lot of the government offices and commercial organizations, including banks, are not operating. Uh, but in, in, the mo in most of the country that's still outside of the Russian forces, the banks are operating. Um, and uh, uh, I know the, one of the questions that was asked previously was how can people support uh, in other ways? So I wanted to mention National Bank of Ukraine. If anyone goes to uh, bank.gov.ua, they have a lot of really internal uh, funding efforts for um, all sorts of support, whatever strikes your fancy. There's military support, there's humanitarian support, there's medical support, there's food, there's shelter, there's refugee support, anything that uh, that someone would like to be involved in, you can support it through the bank. And I know it goes directly to the people on the ground. Uh, there's obviously other organizations like UNICEF, Red Cross, Project Q, or things like that, if, if someone's inclined to support those larger international efforts. Uh, but there are local organizations such as mine and United Hope Ukraine. Uh, I know is a really good one outside of Washington, D.C. that's been involved in helping the Ukrainian people uh, since at least 2014, and they're very involved still now. Perfect. I have two more questions. If I could, get in. If I could oh, chime sorry. in, Shmada. Sure. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Yeah, well, just real quick, uh, because Alex was so great mentioning the Bank of Ukraine, uh, they recently, just as last week, posted that they, they need help with, with aid. I want to mention that maybe some people might not know, since the bank was brought up, the exchange rate is about one third the US dollar. So that also, one, it means that your donation goes three times as far, but also means that internally they may have three times as less uh, funds than, than what we think of as the US dollar translation. So for instance, when uh, when Ukraine says that in the, uh, they have $26 million, uh, which is them asking for more aid and saying that their reserves have been depleted down to 26 million. In US dollars, that's only 8 million. Uh, so we're, uh, that's, so, so just, just think of the currency exchange rate a little bit when, as, as, as you process your donations. Perfect, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Really quick, um, and we may be able to put it in the chat. I think Karina, they're asking, you know, is the Baltimore Odessa Sister City Committee looking for new members? Um, that's one question. So if it's a yes, you can put it in the chat. 100% yes. Okay, 100% yes. We'll make sure yes. that we get that information out um, when we get there. And then this last question that keeps coming up, and I know people are saying they can, you know, with the Airbnbs, they're asking, is booking an Airbnb? that's owned by Ukrainian, a good way also to get money to individuals there? Uh, I, I guess I'll take that question. Uh, I mean, the short answer is yes, it gets the funding into Ukraine uh, and specifically to that individual. What, uh, and I'm not saying uh, don't do it or do it. I'm just saying the reality is it goes to that individual and we're kind of left hoping that they use it for the benefit of others. Uh, obviously, you know, they're themselves, their families and for the benefit of others and support of people who are uh, suffering there on the ground. Um, uh, for broader support um, that's less of an individual and more of a support of the, uh, of the people on the ground as a whole, there's other organizations that, um, uh, that, in my opinion, that's only my opinion, that just do a better job in terms of spreading that around uh, and, and, and helping as many people as possible. Perfect. But it is a way. It, it is, is a way. It is no, a way I hear to, you. It is a way to get money there. So if that's what, you're, if that's what you want to do, yeah. by all means, do it. You know, we want to make sure that we provide, you know, as much information as possible in the questions. Councilman, I'm going to come back to you. Corrine and Alex, I want to thank you. Uh, we're at the 10 o'clock hour. So, Councilman, if you want to close it out or say a few things, we can do that. Thanks so much, Shalanda. Uh, Alex, Corrine, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to help share um, with our group and audience some of the ways that, um, you know, folks can help support Ukrainians uh, during it. But you know, one of the most challenging times ever. So thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity, really, truly thank you.
thank, thank you, you for all. having us on. Thank really so appreciate it. Um, please, just for all of our guests, you know that this will also be on our website. So we'll make sure that we continue to broadcast this information. We'll share the, the resources that were provided as well. And also just want to let you know, we have a couple of upcoming events. I know I mentioned the State of Downtown event that's on May 9th. Earlier, we want to make sure we do that. We also have the Charles Street Promenade that's coming up. So just want to make sure we get as much information out to you all as, poss as soon as possible. And then you can't miss um, the, down the next downtown download that we're having, which is on April 26th, and we'll have Senate President Ferguson here. So we'll hear a lot of what's happening coming out of this legislative session. Thank you all, have a good one, and we'll see you on April 26th, May 9th, and then June 4th. Have a good one. All right, thank you. Have a great week. Thanks everyone.